Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the ICCW Norman Final Presentations. Woo! This is very exciting, very exciting for all of us, very exciting in particular because this is the first time I think in two years to the day or nearly the day that we had a in-person final presentation. There are just a couple of us uh, around that remember those good old days, uh, but this is exciting to be back uh, in person doing presentations. In fact, it's so exciting, I think we had a three-month-old baby come and insist to her mom that she come to this, this presentation. She might be outside right now, though. Uh, this is a great turnout. I see friends and family. I see inventors and mentors the teams. I see alumni who have come back to not only see the final presentation, but also support uh, the teams that they have a connection with. Uh, so this is a terrific representation, not just here in person, but also what I understand, not Facebook Live, YouTube Live, what yeah. TikTok, and we're going to have uh, funny uh, bunny ear uh, filters on all your presentations. I'm kidding. This would be, it'd be very straightforward. And, but you are going to a global audience, so. Uh, very exciting to have you all here for final presentations. Uh, it's been obviously a challenging year with the pandemic, but I am excited to talk about the growth that we've been able to achieve despite the challenges. Thanks to the efforts of the staff and our students, uh, we've continued to expand our program with a focus on venture capital, uh, aligning ourselves with the startup of Boyd Street Ventures, which is OU's Alumni Venture Fund, and also with Cortado Ventures here in town. It has given us the opportunity to greatly expand the number of projects we can work on, the types of experiences that we can offer, the potential for expanding the participation of our students and student experiences in the world of venture capital in Oklahoma and beyond. Uh, I think it's a very exciting uh, wrinkle and effort that ICCW can offer uh, for students going forward in the future. We've also had just a tremendous semester. I think this from top to bottom, you will see uh, some terrific presentations, some great clients, and some great outcomes. I think as the alumni can attest that you've had a very in-depth experience into the world of consulting, and early stage venture, and it will stick with you for a lifetime. I know there are alumni from 10 years past who can still remember their final presentation spiel, their talk, and the details of the, of the technology that they worked with. So this is gonna stick with you. This is gonna be a terrific set of presentations. I'm very excited to turn it over to Cass and the teams. Uh, to, so let's get started. Hello everyone, okay. my name is Dueba. Uh, this semester I had the privilege of leading the energy development team. Um, it was a great experience and uh, one of the things uh, that I have learned uh, from this experience is that engineers and geologists calculate things differently. I remember this one time <laughs> we had a simple multiplication problem and it took us we got the answer, but it took us around 15, okay, maybe 30 minutes to get it, um, which is uh, the, the time, which is less than the time that it took uh, Shivam and Kevin to teach us uh, American football as internationals. <laughs> and um, uh, I, am, I, have, uh, I am very, very lucky that I had the chance to work with a very hardworking team that they used their prior knowledge and experience, skills, um, to make sure that we get the better outcome for our client. Um, also, I would like to thank Kelsey Huggs, um, the, executive, the executive officer of uh, Wind River Resources for giving us this opportunity to work on this project. Um, also, I would like to thank the staff, uh, my fellow Chandler for always bearing with me <laughs> and taking us to the right path. 
Um, also, I would like to thank the attendants today for showing support. Uh, we really appreciate it. And finally, I would like to thank the team for the hard work that they've done. And uh, without any further ado, let's welcome the Fall 2021 Energy Development Team. Hello, everyone. We're we're energy development team working with WRR Wind River Resources, which is a solar construction company that was founded in 2020 by three energy geologists. Me, which is Daniel Jabri, petroleum geologist. Uh, I'm Shim Patel, a chemical engineering major. Um, my name is Toby, I'm a petroleum engineering major. My name is Kevin Shepard, and I'm a petroleum engineering major. Uh, so through our semester worth of research, as well as interviews with executives within the oil and gas industry, as well as the solar industry, lawyers, landmen, and engineers, we have come to the conclusion that the primary market for Wind River resources should be water flooding units, as this represents an initial target market of approximately $189 million within the state of Oklahoma. Oklahoma is currently ranked sixth in the nation in terms of solar potential. However, they are lagging behind other states as they are only 45th in the nation in terms of solar development. Solar currently accounts for only 0.08% of the total electricity generated within the state of Oklahoma. And as we can see on the chart to the left here, fossil fuels still account for over 60% of electricity generation in the state. So Oklahoma has historically been a large oil and gas producing state and is currently fourth in the nation as the largest oil producer in the country. And this presents opportunity as there is a lot of infrastructure associated with these oil and gas infrastructure, such as roads, well pads, um, substations and tra transmission lines, which can be utilized by solar companies to be placed on these well pads. So in addition to that, investors within the oil and gas industry have been increasingly interested in moving towards ESG and sustainability. So solar projects such as this one can provide oil and gas opportunities with an opportunity to diversify as the country moves into the energy transition. So now, next, we will talk about how this is implicated in the state of Oklahoma. So in Oklahoma, the problem lies with these oil and gas companies with water flooding units, um, economically and environmentally because of their high energy output and their wells being on scarred land. And economically, they're a problem because uh, these units have a variety and a mixture of inactive and active wells. And these inactive wells are liabilities for these oil and gas companies because they're taking up space on these leases while at the same time not producing any revenue. And then also, these active wells on these water flooding units are secondary recovery, which means that they have high operation costs because of their high energy uses. And because, on average, over $300,000 of cost worth of electricity is used for the, to operate these, all these water flooding units. And the environmental problems for these oil and gas companies are that they have strict regulations now to cut down their carbon emissions by 52% by 2030. And these are extremely hard for these oil and gas companies, especially the ones with high density of inactive wells, because each inactive well emits about 54 kilograms each annually. And this comes from the, just the hole in the ground of not being capped or not being plugged. And this is where WR can come in. They can offer a solution, a partnership for these oil and gas companies to turn these liabilities into assets and taking advantage of these existing infrastructures that they already have. So these inactive wells, would we would be able to construct solar panels, a solar farm on these inactive well pads, and to be able to now utilize the space that would otherwise not be used. And then also, these solar panels would be producing its own electricity from these solar farms. And then when producing their own electricity, that would lower their operation costs for by over $5 million in the next 25 years. And then in, in, environmentally, this is uh, beneficial for these oil and gas companies because it would directly reduce their scope to emissions, their carbon emissions, because their carbon footprint previously of high having, having high energy output from burning a fossil fuel for their electricity. And one megawatt of solar energy alone can offset 31,500 tons of carbon dioxide. And this directly would 
correlate to improvement in their ESG performance. And ESG is, is an investment strategy that stands for environmental, social, and governance. And they're important for these oil and gas companies because it is directly related to attracting new investors, uh, driving up stock prices, and also reducing their overall debt. And now we'll talk about how WRR's project would look like. So moving forward, we subjected our assumptions on our study area, which is the Tatum field. So, and, we and our research results showed that by installing uh, 7,875 solar panels on a water flooding unit will be, suffi will be sufficient to power 37% of the annual average of the total electricity for the field's demand. So what is a water flooding operation? Basically, it's a secondary recovery of pumping a water or injecting water in a reservoir formation to help reducing the mining oil in the reservoir. And then after the interviews that we had, we found out that uh, 30, uh, by covering 13 acres with the solar with a pa solar power capacity of 3.15 megawatts will be enough to reduce the electricity demand for the Tatum fields. So, also, uh, how does all of this work? Basically, the sunlight has the solar panels, and then we generate the current. Th uh, that current flows to an inventor, and then it gets converted to a mo to the most usable type of electricity. And then that electricity will flow to a meter, and then it will get distributed whether to the field or to the uh, and the excess electricity will get distributed to the utility company. However, if the so if the generated electricity from the solar panels wasn't enough to to power the field, then additional electricity is generated from the utility companies, and that exchange of electricity between the field and the utility companies happens by time of use net metering. That means that they sell the electricity with higher cost during the peak hours, and then they buy it with a lower cost during the off hours or the night hours, and that depends on the year and the season. And now I'll leave you with Kevin to discuss the market for WRR. So as previously stated, um, water flooding units should be the primary target for WRR in the state of Oklahoma, as these units represent a potential market opportunity of approximately $189 million within the state. So the reason, some of the reasons why water flooding units should be targeted is because they combine multiple primary leases into one unit, which means that they can house over 200 wells in one unit. And the oil and gas companies are actually the primary majority interest holders within these leases, which means that they can determine what type of infrastructure is being used to help extract oil and gas. And as we can see in the figure on the right here, there are over a thousand total water flooding units in the nation. And Oklahoma actually has over 200 of these water flooding units, and that doesn't even ac account for units on tribal lands. And then Citation Oil and Gas actually has the most amount of these units within the state of Oklahoma at 29. And we had the privilege of speaking with Citation Oil and Gas's engineering manager, and he gave us some numbers which helped us build our financial and business models. And as we can see, water flooding units are very energy intensive as they require on average between three and seven megawatts of electricity, and they are being run 24 hours a day. So this adds up to a lot of electricity and as previously stated, these solar projects can provide oil and gas companies with an opportunity to save approximately $5 million on their electricity bill over the useful life of a solar panel, which is approximately 25 years. And now we will talk more about the business model. So the profitability of partnership with oil and gas companies as well as the landowners creates a positive outcome for all of the parties involved. Having the landowners to sign an agreement of 20 to 25 years with the oil and gas company guarantees the landowners a revenue of $1,000 per acre. And then having the oil and gas company to sign a construction agreement with WRR will reduce the electricity demand, will reduce the electricity cost for the water flooding units on the field, which is currently four cents, and then also will guarantee WRR a $500, a $500 per, per panel. And then the oil and gas company can decide to sign an agreement with the utility companies for the electricity exchange, which again, it will happen with net metering. For our case, we'll be selling it during uh, the day hours by, th uh, by, three, by, three cent by three cents, and then buying it by two cents, and also the average cost and the savings of the net metering depends on the utility companies that will be involved in the agreement. And now Toby will discuss the financial applications of the project. 
So um, we've shown how these projects can work. We've shown there's a massive um, market in Oklahoma and across the U.S. And now, is, it, is this project profitable? Our financial model tells us it is. Um, we estimate, estimated that it's going to take um, $3.9 million to actually const construct this project. And the, um, the, the oil and gas company can earn 26% federal solar tax credits for the year 2022, which um, roughly amounts to over $1 million for the company sa of savings. And we, we also um, try to include um, earnings for WIR, uh, roughly 30 cents for every kilow kilowatt WIR installs. So for, this, for a particular base project, WRR can earn $45,000 in trying to um, install and commission this project. And a few financial metrics we looked at at, at the break-even points, we, we see positive cash flow savings for, for this project at year 12, and the um, internal rate of return stands roughly around 10%. And our next slide will show um, our five years future plan for WRR. So together we came up with a five-year plan for WR in order to take full advantage of the market of water flood units that are across Oklahoma. So within the first year, we know solar panels are a large initial investment. So we came up with a pilot program that would construct 50% of the project in a water flooding unit. And then within the next two years, the data, of, the data and analytics of the cost benefits of saving on operation costs for the electricity will be studied. Then after that two years of studying how these solar panels and how much is being saved, they would recontinue construction of 100%. And then after that pilot project is complete, then WR can, explore, can start exploring more market opportunities across Oklahoma. And just for example, uh, the Burbank field of Osage has over 1,200 uh, water flooding wells alone in their county who have expressed uh, the desire to get into the solar market. And then after exploring the opportunity in other markets, then WR can start recontinuing their construction and model these projects in five years later by their pilot project, and then they can start expanding and taking even more advantage of the market opportunity that Oklahoma provides. And I'm going to pass it off to Toby to wrap it up with the key points of this project. So um, to recap what the energy team has been trying to say so far, um, there's a massive business opportunity for both WRR and oil and gas company across the U.S. and Oklahoma to partnership. Um, like, I said, like I mentioned earlier in our financial modeling, WRR can earn 30 cents for every kilowatt hour it installs. Um, and for our base projects, um, WR can earn almost a million dollars for installing the 3.15 megawatt project. There's also um, 100 plus potential water flooding um, units across Oklahoma and the U.S. And this provides an opportunity for WR to grow as a company. And for the oil and gas companies, they can save $5 million in utility costs over the 25 years of, this, um, of the solar fan. And the oil and gas company can provide 37% of its annual electricity needs from the solar PV and thereby helping its cost its CO2 emissions by 30%. Um, that's it for the energy team. Thank you for listening and open the floor to any other any questions. Um, no, we we did uh, we didn't um, consider um, using the gas. So you mean instead of flaring the gas or something, using it to power the fuel? Correct. Yeah. Um, so no, we did not consider um, that for our base case um, because uh, for our base case it was just a um, oil producing fuel, so we didn't look into that. Um, but a key point we, um, we 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 saw from our financial model is that um, the the units uh, cost. Um, for the solar farm is roughly um, 2.8 cents for every kilowatt compared to um, 4 cents we, um, the oil and gas company can get from the, from the grid. So there's an advantage um, for the solar farm project. Any other questions? Um, so you ask if WRR is a solar fan produce, solar panel? 
Oh, no, no. WRR is a solar construction company. So for the, the, main, the big idea for this project is for WRR to partner with these oil and gas companies and help install these solar projects on water flooding units. So you ask what indicate we, we have to show that um, yeah, oil and gas company ready to partner with WR. Um, Kevin, you want to go? Um, well, we talked with Citation Oil and Gas's engineering uh, manager, and he seemed very interested with the project. If we could come up with a plan where it would be economically viable for the the company. And that that also includes. We also talked to um, Mac Mac. Um, we also had the privilege to talk with the, uh, Mr. McClin uh, Mr. McCasland of Mac Energy, and he said if he could find a possibility of solar panels being um, profitable in the open market, that they could themselves see it being uh, a project that they could do, and like that's what this pilot project would be able to show um, for these oil and gas companies because they're a very uh, tight knit community. So once one um, once we can find one oil and gas company that finds interest, a lot of them start to kind of follow, especially with ESG performances being uh, a very new trend in oil and gas nowadays. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, I think the biggest challenges is that just with working with oil and gas, it has a lot of moving parts to it. So with our interview, interviews that we had, we had to have it a wide variety of people with legal teams, landmen, uh, executive, renewable energy, and just every tiny little aspect that you might not consider on like a big project like this that we all had to take into consideration and in what takes part in such a what seems like a simple project but with a lot of moving parts. So to bring all those little parts together and to make a project like this even viable. Th thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Burroughs, and I am the team leader for the tech commercialization team. Over the past three months, I have had the privilege of working alongside Suri, Oyen, Tanaka, and Prakat, who are four brilliantly minded individuals. To say that our project had a few pivots over the semester would be an understatement. However, it was my pleasure and my joy to watch the team maintain and uphold a stance of um, a willingness to adapt at every single point. Um, yes, <laughs> I think I can um, confidently say that we have all become morning persons given our 7 a.m. meetings, sometimes occurring three times per week, whether that was meeting for our team meetings or whether um, we were updating clients or staff at biweeklies. I would like to take this time to thank our staff, including both directors and fellows. And I want to highlight Sue and Philippa for their immense wisdom and extra time that they have poured into our team to make sure that we were fully equipped at every point. I would also like to extend thanks and gratitude to our amazing clients for entrusting us with this project. I am very pleased with the work that the team has done, and I can assure you that the uh, informed set of recommendations which they have made does not fall short of excellence. I will truly miss Ceri's love for brain teasers. I will miss Tanaka's critical eye for design, Prakat's insane skills to do quick maths, and Oyen's willingness to answer the hard questions, and her ability to manage both the internship and completing her thesis. Congratulations to her as she is graduating this December. <laughs> yes. And 
And at this time, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to the Fall 2021 Pet Commercialization Team. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are the Tech Commercialization Team, in which we commercialize new and innovative technology. This semester, it is our privilege to work with Dr. Townsend and Dr. Dedimore from Leafa Biotech on their product BoneLink, a bone void filler that is used in cranial procedures. This semester, our team leader is Jennifer Burrows and our fellow is Philippa Carvalho. My name is Siri Naguri and I'm a sophomore pursuing a degree in chemical biosciences. My name is Corian, I'm a graduate student pursuing a degree in data science and analytics. My name is Tanaka, I'm a junior studying economics in MIS. And my name is Prakhyat, and I'm a sophomore studying MIS. This semester, our team identified that Leafa Biotech can make the biggest impact in both alveolar cleft and jaw reconstruction surgery market, which represents a $40 million market size and consists of over 15,000 patients. To effectively reach these patients, we've determined key manufacturing protocols as well as devised a financial plan that gives Leafa Biotech over $5 million within its fifth year of launching, considering a 3.5% annual growth rate. For this project, we've also consulted with over 50 experts in both healthcare and business professions whose insights help create a business model that gives Leafa Biotech the most success. As complex as they seem, craniofacial voids or holes in the skull can greatly impact a patient's physical, mental, and social well-being. Patients undergo severe stress considering how painful daily activities such as eating, breathing, and sleeping can be for them. Dr. Marcus from Duke Hospital has also stated that no matter how minimally invasive a surgery might seem, patients have to walk out of the hospital with almost three weeks of just pure pain. On top of this, patients also have to undergo stress due to misjudgment and mistreatment for the voids that they may have. Craniofacial voids can occur either through traumatic incidences or be caused by birth. Traumatic incidences cause up to 35,000 cranial voids per year, where patients would have to undergo procedures like craniotomy or jaw reconstruction surgery. On the other hand, Almost 5,000 babies are born with alveolar clefts, where they would have to get bone grafting procedures to get this treated. Now, the bone void fillers that surgeons are currently using to treat these patients pose many issues. Firstly, they can be expensive, costing up to $3,000 for a single use, while only promoting little to no bone regeneration and have slow setting rates. Because of these slow setting rates, the void may not be filled with the filler and the filler might migrate away. Dr. Andrews from Iowa State Center stated that alloplastic uh, procedures or bone void fillers cause five times as many infections as using the patient's own bone cells do. However, using the patient's own bone cells can, can require creating an additional surgical site on the patient's body, which can increase their overall healing time. Considering all of these factors, BoneLink was created to be the solution that could combat all of these issues that both patients and hospitals were facing in this market. Firstly, BoneLink is on average $2,000 less than other bone void fillers, while also having as much regeneration as 80%. BoneLink also sets 13 minutes faster than other bone void fillers, while also guaranteeing its place within the void. And lastly, patients who use Bone BoneLink would not have to get an other additional surgical site and can lessen their overall healing time. Now that we've taken a look into the overall market issues and how BoneLink can address them, let's take a closer look into how the technology works. BoneLink has distinctive properties that differentiate it from the other bone void fillers that are on the market. Some of the major, um, some of the major parts of BoneLink is the pentaenoic hyaluronic acid and also the thiolated demineralized bone matrix. These two properties of bone link helps bone link with the, helps with the bone link bone regeneration. And this helps bone link to go through the process of osteoinduction, which is converting the bone void filler into the patient's own bone. And also, bone link sets in one to two minutes. The reason why bone link is able to do this is because of the UV lights that are used in bone link. 
The UV light helps photo cross-linking, which is the formation of covalent bond between the, vo the void and also the patient's own bone. And also, in addition to the efficiency of bone link, bone link also has very good aesthetic properties, which means that after the, the the void, the bone link has been put into the patient's void. It looks very good and it promotes very smooth surgical area. Now that we've spoken about the technology of bone link, we're now going to talk about the ideal market that we targeted for bone link. During the research that we did into bone link specific markets, we looked at six different markets and we're able to identify cleft, alveolar cleft, and the jury construction market as the initial phase that bone link would go into. In the later phase approach, we look for bone link to go into the cranial tummy market. The three markets we identified have a total market size of $40 million. According to Dr. Tenak Tenwaya at the OU Health Center, we see that most, more than 90% of surgeons actually use autografting for the bone for the surgeries that they do. And this is because of the high bone regeneration that autographs have. But in recent research that is currently being done, we see that many surgeons are trying to move towards bone morphogenic proteins. And this is because bone morphogenic proteins have some bone regeneration, but not as high as the patient's own bone. And in addition to this, BMPs also have high risk for cancer when used in patients. And this is why many surgeons are not willing to move towards this. Autografting are very expensive, they are painful, and then they require multiple surgeries. And the major, the major needs for the particular market we're looking at is high, high structural strength, high material retention, and also high bone regeneration. This is where bone link comes into this market, as bone link is able to fit into the need that this requires here. And this is according to Dr. Sylvan and Dr. Smith at the OUHSC. In addition to this, for bone link to actually be used by any surgeon at all, it has to be FDA cleared. What this means is that bone link has to show that it can work as well as any other bone void filler that is currently on the market. And this market of alveolar cleft and jaw reconstruction market actually requires just FDA clearance. But the craniotomy market, according to most of the surgeons we spoke to, will require bone link to have FDA approval. The FDA approval is another path that bone link can go to, but it takes way more time. It takes like nine years and it's also very expensive. So this is a place that bone link can do later on along the years if they decide to do that. Now that we have identified the ideal markets, the ideal initial markets for bowling to be jaw reconstruction and alveolar cleft, we will now look at the, the distinctive properties that bowling have in this market against their competitors. Thank you very much, Oyen. Um, now, what we understood from all the interviews that we had with different surgeons and key medical personnel in the medical device industry was the fact that for any medical device to be successful, it needs to have certain key features that distinguish it from its competitors. And for bone void fillers, these key features are material retention, natural bone regeneration, quick setting time, and also cost effectiveness. For the first two, that is material retention and natural bone regeneration, we notice that, as we can see on the matrix, that only Lethal Biotech and Medtronix Infuse have these features. This is because, as previously mentioned, Lethal Biotech has a cross-linking technology that allows this to happen, whilst Medtronix Infuse contains bone morphogenetic protein, which is BMP, as previously mentioned, that promotes bone growth. The other three, J&J's DBX, Stryker's Hydroset, and also 3D Native's 3D Implants, do not have this because they're all synthetic. When it comes to the setting time, all these products have quick setting time. However, Bone Link has the fastest, which is one to two minutes, whilst the others have a setting time of an average of 10 to 15 minutes. When it comes to the cost effectiveness, we notice that um, Medtronics Infuse and 3D Native 3D implants do not have this. This is because Medtronics Infuse can be sold for 3,000 going up, while 3D Native 3D implants can be sold anywhere from 1,000 going up, depending on the surface area they're used on and the number of screws. And then the other three, uh, the other three which are cost effective are all sold for an average of $1,000, whilst BoneLink is the cheapest that can be sold from $500 to $1,000. And with these competitive advantages, we decided to draft a business model to see how we could sell or how we could turn these advantages to profit and sales for Leafa Biotech. And this is the business model that we drafted to sell one unit of BoneLink to the end user, which is the hospitals. Now, firstly, before bone link can begin producing, it needs to have certain conditions that it meets. And this includes the manufacturer registration and also the FDA clearance. Once this is done, production can then begin. And in production, there are certain costs involved. This is the storage, packaging, quality testing, and also the cost to pay a distributor. And for distributors, they are paid anywhere from 25% to 40% commission. But 
since Leafa Biotech is a smaller company, it will have to pay somewhere in the upper end, so 40%, for example. And once we calculate all those costs, once we sum them up, we came up with the cost of goods sold with the production and also the distribution cost of 555 US dollars. And for the distributor, the type of distributor that we were going for is a third party distributors as recommended by the interviewees that we had. They all recommended that a third party distributor is efficient for a company such as Leafa Biotech. And also, uh, the type of third party distributor that we'll be looking at is a 1099 distributor. 1099 distributors are independent d sales distributors that have sales reps. And these sales reps have relationships with hospitals and clinics and other facilities. And these sales reps are responsible for marketing Leafa Biotech's bone link to the end user, which is the hospitals. Now, once our product is marketed, well, once Leafa Biotech's product is marketed to the end users, which is the hospitals, then there are two processes involved that have to happen at the hospital. This includes the surgeon vouching for the product, that is, they have to recommend it, and also the purchasing committee at the hospital has to see if they have the funds for this product. And once these two processes or these conditions are met, then Leafa Biotech's bone link is sold for 1,000 US dollars, and they make a net profit of 445 dollars. Now, now that we've seen how efficient a third-party distributor could assist Leafa Biotech in this business model, we'll now look at the financial implications of implementing this business model. Oh, thank you, Tanaka. And I will now further explain the financial modeling that we've done for Leafa Biotech. Our biggest takeaway, as you can see, is that Leafa Biotech would be able to make a profit of $5.6 million by its fifth year of commercial operations. By this, it is essentially uh, since uh, Leafa Biotech starts sales of BoneLink. Now, in order to uh, come up with our financial, uh, financial modeling, we've done uh, model inputs that are based on a few key assumptions, which helped us make our profit and loss forecasting. And for our model inputs, the key assumptions that we went with were that there would be an initial demand of 15,000 units. This is based on the market research the team has done as well as interviews with hospitals and doctors that gave us an understanding of their likeliness to switch to a product of BoneLink's properties. The second assumption is that the initial cost would be set at about $1,000 per unit, as this would keep it competitively priced with other bone void fillers, while uh, having healthy margin. And lastly, the annual growth rate would be set at 3.5%, and this is a conservative estimate based on the entire market, which is set to grow at 7%, but bone link will initially only target the craniofacial segment and the two procedures within it. And as you can see from the chart over here, uh, in its first year, it is set to make $15 million. And that amount grows by 40% to $21 million by its fifth year. And the profit is also set to almost double from the first year to the fifth. And a few of the other assumptions that we've made are the licensing agreement that LIFA has with OU as well as payroll and the royalties that it's expected to pay. And in order to make a successful entry to the market, the next steps will be very crucial for Leafa Biotech. So in its first year, it should prepare for the FDA pre-submission, and for this, it would need a quality management system as well as intellectual property filing. By its second year, it should be ready for the FDA clearance application, which involves a regulatory approval and then it can start building partnerships with players such as quality assurance and distributors. By the third year, it is set to be in a position to make a commercial operations, which involves entry into the alveolar cleft and jewelry construction market, and it can start tracking important metrics, which will help it boost sales. And from the fourth year onwards, it can prepare for expansion by designing trials for uh, the craniotomy market, as well as consider the FDA approval track. And lastly, once the company matures, it is in a position to seek licensing and acquisition opportunities. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today, and we would like to open the floor to questions. Okay, so uh, in terms of the financial, uh, financial modeling, it is set to start with the first year of commercial operations. 
And in order to get to the stage, the company needs to undergo the FDA clearance process, which is its first priority. And that can range from anywhere from $30,000 to $150,000, which the, uh, many medical uh, technology companies like Leafa generally go through a grants process to receive uh, funds for such activities. how many interviews we're able to get. Yeah, um, so for the, both the market and the business model, we got about over 50 interviews for this project. So there are definitely a lot of questions that we could ask to um, other bone void filler companies that are just starting their commercial operations right now to see how their um, their financial plans have been going, how their business runs, and if we could, or if Leafa Biotech could learn a little bit more about that. So that's definitely some people who would uh, we would love to contact for further information. The question is regarding talking to specific 3D implant companies. So we chose them based on what the other cranial facial surgeons are using. Most of them did mention certain uh, companies such as Stryker, um, Medtronic, and 3D Natives. And so that's how we decided to um, talk to them specifically. So just considering how many people, um, how many surgeons are using a particular product and then talking to them more about it. Okay, we have time for one last question. Okay, Philippa. So the question is regarding different types of surgery. So cranial surgeries are used in craniofacial procedures, as well as veterinary uses, spinal fusions, um, and certain rhinoplasty procedures. So these are all considered potential markets for Leafa Biotech to enter. However, each market does have their own guidelines. So for example, if Leafa Biotech wanted to enter into spinal fusions, uh, Dr. Martin from OUHC actually said that he would love to implement a product like BoneLink. However, he would also like to see human trials conducted for spinal fusion specifically. So uh, while there are many potential markets, there could be additional costs before entering it. Hello everyone. It's lovely seeing so many faces out here. My name is Preeta Tanunathan. I'm a senior studying aerospace engineering and I'm the team lead for the Agile product design team. Wow, where do I start? From going to the state fair to conduct interviews to random boba runs, I can confidently say it's been a fun semester. We cannot start our meetings without Vivek's wins and losses and without Edita's editing skills, our logos would probably be different sizes. Um, if Jessica didn't work at the iHub, I don't think we would have a prototype right now. And lastly, but not the least, without Michael and Patrick's funny jokes, our meetings would be very quiet. I can say for a fact, I don't think we've had a quiet meeting so far. Every meeting has been really fun. I remember um, one day we were on the fifth floor of Devon having a crazy prototyping session, and we were so loud and obnoxious, and we got so many stares. But then I realized that's what APD is all about. 
My team continues to make me very proud. Um, it's almost scary because I was gone for a week and they seem to be way more productive than they were. So I was thinking, is my job on the line? <laughs> I also want to thank Chandler, my fellow, for always being available and answering my questions. He's very famous for his, what do you think you should do? <laughs> but hey, it's definitely worked. Uh, nonetheless, I'm grateful for his support throughout my journey as team lead. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Dan Nigel, my team lead from last semester, for always sticking around and being a mentor in my college career. I also want to thank staff for giving us very valuable feedback all the time and allowing us to be 100% present in this project. Lastly, a very important person, our client, Brian Mater. He's so inspirational and his drive for sustainability is so inspiring that me and my team feel very, very attached to this project. The team was very moved by his dedication towards sustainability and green infrastructure that um, we feel that this project is very personal to us. And I'm so excited for you guys to see what APD has come up with this semester. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our final presentation. We're the Agile Product Design Team. Have you ever wanted to purchase an environmentally sustainable product but found that it wasn't visually appealing? Well, this semester, we had the privilege to work with Brian Metter of Plant Seeds to design an aesthetically pleasing, scalable, and sustainably made rainwater harvesting barrel. Uh, Plant Seeds is a company that's dedicated to sustainability, as Preetha mentioned. And after a previous product launch, they're looking to venture into rain barrels, and that's where we as a team came in. Uh, after conducting interviews with over 40 potential customers, having an interviews with en uh, engineers and polymer chemists, and also conducting hundreds of hours of research and uh, going through four different prototypes, we were able to conclude that our product is expected to sell, uh, or projected to sell 120,000 units over five years and generate $3.9 million in revenue over the same time span. So what is the issue with existing rainwater reclamation devices? They already exist, but people aren't buying them. One issue is the material. These are often made out of virgin plastics, and at the end of their lifespan, they're sent immediately to the landfill, which is absolutely terrible for our environment and aids in the addition of microplastics as well. The second issue is capacity. Barrels come in about three standard sizes, 50, 100, and 150 gallons. This means that consumers are unable to customize rainwater systems to their needs. Through primary research in the form of interviews, we found that when people can't have the capacity that they need, they would rather not have a rainwater system at all. The third issue is aesthetics. The bulky and industrial design of most barrels is off-putting to many consumers. Through an interview, we found that one person's neighbors commented so much on the appearance of their barrel that they actually decided to get rid of the system entirely. So what is Plant Seeds going to do about this? Plant Seeds is going to Plant Seeds has created a solution to this that meets the consumers at their needs. So the first issue, materials, we have decided to use recycled polypropylene because this can be itself recycled and will save on water and time in manufacturing and for the consumers. The second issue, capacity, we have decided to make our barrel scale scalable and, has, and it has a modular design so that consumers can pick and stack the barrels to customize their water to their needs. The third issue, aesthetics, we have decided to go for a nature-inspired design that adds a hint of play and blends in with every building's exterior. For this, we have chosen bamboo as our main inspiration. So after four initial designs and over 50 hours of prototyping sessions, we have narrowed down to an ideal um, human-centered minimalistic rain barrel that is easy to set up while providing an aesthetically appealing solution to rainwater harvesting. So our prototype takes into consideration the issues consumers have with existing products and through 46 interviews and surveys, we have finalized the size, the shape, and the design characteristics of our ideal rain barrel. So in regards to the size, we have chosen a 20 gallon size of one unit that has the option of being customizable to fit the needs of every consumer. The way this is done is by stacking the rain barrels one on top of the other and aligning these standardized 3 fourths of an inch diameter ports on the lid as well as the bottom of the top rain barrel and connecting them with materials that are easily found in your nearest home improvement store. Through our research, we have also found that aesthetics are a big concern for most sustainable homeowners, so we have decided to design a minimalistic bamboo shape inspired rain barrel that fits with the exterior of every home. When it comes to the design characteristics, um, which can also be seen on our 3D printed like mini version of our prototype, um, 
when it comes to the lid, it is, comes with rubber seals that prevents leaking and also comes with a small hook um, for the ease of opening of the lid. This is very important for both the maintenance as well as the storing of the rain harvesting system. The way we are keeping the entire rain harvesting system stable is through vertical supports for the lid, which are found on the inside of the rain barrel to make sure that the lid sits very securely, as well as the indentation in the lid, which makes sure that the top rain barrel sits very sturdy without any movement. And finally, our rain barrel is easy to set up and um, doesn't take a long time, and um, it can be set up with very few materials that can be easily found in your nearest home improvement stores. So after finalizing the design of our product, it's then important to ask how will it be manufactured and produced. We spoke with multiple engineers who all suggested that we should split up manufacturing into two pieces because if we were to manufacture the whole thing all together, it would create too big of a mold that many manufacturers wouldn't have the capacity to use. So the top piece will be injection molded and the bottom piece will be blow molded. Some benefits of this are that there will be more there will be more manufacturers that will have the ability to injection mold the top piece. Again, because it's smaller, there doesn't need to be as large of a capacity of machines in order to feed it. Secondly, it will be a cheaper overall mold cost. If we were to use one mold, it would be really expensive because a 20-gallon drum is a huge plastic piece that many manufacturers couldn't do. So if we, were, if we had to find one that was that large, it would be very rare and a lot more expensive. However, some drawbacks of this will be finding a blow molder. If we're going to blow mold the bottom piece, it'll be harder to find because blow molding isn't as uh, common of an option for manufacturing plastics, so it'll be more difficult to find one. However, we did locate a few in Tulsa and Oklahoma City, so it's possible to find one pretty locally. Secondly, due to COVID, a lot of um, overseas shipping has gotten delayed, so if we're ordering two molds which have to be shipped from overseas, there's more of a likelihood that one of them will get delayed. Um, we spoke with one manufacturer who said they ordered um, a mold back in June and they still haven't received it. This was in like mid-October. So again, having two of these molds rather than one will have a greater chance of at least one, one of them getting delayed. For our material, at first we were comparing traditional plastics to bioplastics because of the green aspect of bi that bioplastics offer. However, there are a lot of drawbacks to bioplastics because it's such a new industry. Many manufacturers won't use them. They're afraid of how they might affect their machines and they might make them break or just the overall adjustments that would have to be taken place would be really expensive for the manufacturer to do. So then we spoke with a polymer chemist who suggested polypropylene because it's very strong and it keeps its material properties even after it's been recycled. Another great thing about polypropylene is it can be recycled many times over. So after someone is done with our product, they can recycle it again and it can go back into the manufacturing into a to a new material for plastics. So looking at some current market products that are on the line, there are a wide variety of different plastics, of different rain barrel plastics that are available, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. However, all of them have their own drawbacks. First, we have barrels that are designed with aesthetics in mind. The biggest drawback for the customer here a lot of times is how expensive they are. These are oftentimes the most expensive model, and they can't be scaled to the customer's needs a lot of times without being a detriment to their aesthetics. In addition, they aren't made from recycled materials like ours will be, um, which brings us to the next type of barrel, which is the recycled plastics barrel. So this one from the Conservation Foundation will actually be made from the same type of material as ours, recycled polypropylene. However, it can't be scaled or attached to the customer's needs, and it fails to um, bring into aesthetics into account. It's just the standard barrel design that we've seen so many times. Lastly, we have the attachable and scalable models. Uh, these, of course, aren't made from recycled plastics, and even if they are scaled up, it comes at the cost of a lot of manual labor to the customer. They have to manually drill in these holes. Uh, we spoke to some older potential customers and clients. They said they would have to hire someone else to come and drill in the holes to make it expandable to their needs. So the plant seeds barrel, while while maintaining aesthetics and an eco-friendly material from recycled polypropylene, we also have made it so that it's easily scalable to the customer, all while keeping a lower price point. Uh, there are about 2.1 million new homeowners in the US, and this will allow plant seeds to tap into a financial market of about 197 million US dollars. Uh, for our target market, we will be considering new homeowners uh, between 35 to 65 years of age, and this is because we found out that about 42% uh, of our target market do have home gardens. And of the 82.8 .8 million uh, U.S. households, about 33 million of them 
do have home gardens. And the 2.6 uh, annual growth rate in the new homeowners in the United States is the largest increase ever recorded between uh, 2015 and 2020. Uh, so this gives, uh, shows that the new homeowner market is an ever-growing market. And with at least 53% of the new homeowners willing to spend at least $5,000 uh, for a sustainable home, uh, this gives uh, our client financial certainty venturing into the new homeowner market. So we've identified our target customer, how we deliver our product to them. It will start with our product being manufactured locally from recycled pro polypropylene, as mentioned. And then from after manufacturing, it will reach plant seeds uh, at a packaging or, or packaging and warehouse facility. And then from there, it could reach the customer through two channels. It could, the customer could purchase it online or they could reach it through the home, a home local home improvement store. And so the benefits of selling the product at a local home improvement store would be that a larger sales volume can be achieved since more customers shop at, th there's an existing customer base that shop at large name retailers. And then the, the drawbacks are that customers who don't live near a participating store are not able to purchase that. And in order to mitigate that, the product can also be sold online through the Pant Seeds website and uh, a customer base, a smaller customer base will be reached, but it's more accessible for those who can't purchase it in store. And so some costs associated with the business model are gonna be on the manufacturing and tooling side. We obtained a quote from a manufacturer who said uh, our two molds would be approximately $68,000 and that uh, manufacturing and transport could, will be approximately $12 a unit. And then on whenever, the sh whenever the product's being shipped to the customer through the, cu the Plancy's website, it's estimated that shipping will be about $15 a unit. Um, and it's important to mention on the business model that the, sale, the price for the customer will be the same, whether it's purchased in store or online. The smaller wholesale price is, as a, is a result of the, the store eventually marking it up by about 20%. So the price will be about the same for the customer on both ends. So we've identified um, our product will make money exactly how much. The product's expected to generate over $3.9 million in revenue over five years and sell over 120,000 units. And some other important metrics associated with our financial model are that our client will have to sell about 3,000 units in order to break even on an initial investment and that the return on investment window for that is about one and a half to, or one to one and a half years. And so some major assumptions associated with our financial model are that the first year will be dedicated to research and development, informing the supply chain and overall quality assurance as well. So the first year will, will, won't generate any unit, um, unit sales. The second major assumption is that the fraction of in-store sales will increase over time and that our clients able to obtain more store sponsorships and uh, be able to market our product in a greater amount of stores. And so that's another major assumption. And then the third major assumption is that marketing costs will be approximately 5% of yearly revenue. And so in order to uh, increase the amount of in-store sales or uh, online sales every year, we're expected to spend about 5% of our yearly revenue with an online sales conversion rate of about 2%. Uh, so for our next steps, we have identified three potential steps that uh, our client is going to proceed with this product. Uh, the first step is going to be the research and development phase, and this is going to include our client contacting, uh, carrying out like a low fidelity prototype testing for the product and also uh, carrying out more customer reviews and uh, surveys. And the next thing is going to be the supply chain, and this is going to involve our client negotiating contracts with uh, retailers and also contacting the big box and also home improvement stores. And the final step is going to be the sales and marketing. Uh, we have identified a few uh, green marketing te techniques that our client can use, and that's going to be the use of social media influencers, uh, blog posts, and also uh, the home improve uh, and also the community organizations that our client can partner with. Um, so thank you for coming to our presentation. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our team lead, Preetha, for guiding us through this semester, our wonderful client, Brian Metter, who was a wonderful and amazing resource um, to our research um, period, as well as our wonderful staff for um, providing amazing feedback, as always. And now we would like to open the floor to any questions.
So are you, I'm sorry, are you asking about the advertising or the actual sales of it? The okay, so the question was how will marketing and the advertising of sales facilitate, be facilitated through the website? Um, so how we're gonna do that is through Brian's current website, plantseeds.com. Um, you, um, you can order his materials through there. You can also learn more about his website. Um, like uh, Vivek mentioned earlier, we'll have social media influencers and we'll use other methods of what's called applied green marketing to show um, factually and truthfully how our product, which is a green product, um, can benefit the environment as well as the end user. Yeah, so the manufacturing side's pretty standardized, so we could use two separate ones. However, it might be cheaper or just easier for, for Brian, our client, to do quality assurance, especially since it's a startup company. Um, so the difficulty there is finding the blow molder. Essentially, every manuf plastics manufacturing group will have injection molding because it's the most common type of plastics manufacturing. Um, so if we can find a blow molder, a lot of times they'll also have injection molding on site, which is why we wanted to make the fin so much smaller. It helps to guarantee that the injection molding facility or part of the facility will be large enough. Um, the issue there was that if we injection molded the whole thing, it would have been really difficult. So the smaller we can make that injection molded piece, the better and the more likely the chance that a blow molder will have the equipment to do the injection molded side too. We have time for just one more question. Uh, yes, we did look at different markets. So we looked at the uh, agricultural industry, whereby like we could uh, market our product to clients, uh, to farmers. But then what we found with that market is that uh, most of their needs require large uh, amounts of water, and we basically have to uh, upscale our products. And for this our initial market, uh, that's going to be uh, a, a very large cost for our clients. So that's why I decided to focus more on the homeowner markets and also people who do home gardening because we can more like tailor our product towards their, their needs. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna try something. Please don't leave me hanging, okay? <laughs> When I say OF, you say yay. Can we do that? Okay. OF. Yay. OF. Yay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, yeah, we are OFA group. Um, and Isaac will tell you why we're special. But it's been such a pleasure working with the team, working with just our fellow and having all the entire staff on our team as individual um, advisors for the interns. Uh, we have so many stories. Um, <laughs> of how our 7 a.m. team meetings also went. But I can tell you that Stuart for sure loves PCS because he wears the, the sweatshirt to every team meeting and um, every Monday class. Um, Irene loves her job in IT, but there's always some drama with people calling at 7 a.m. in the morning for a pop-up on their laptop that she cannot fix. But <laughs> she always tries, and for Isaac, um, he's going to be such a fluent Latin speaking very soon as far as he passes his Latin classes because he's doing such an amazing job. Um, finally, for Suraj, uh, <laughs> Suraj has a very nice sense of humor that you know tickled me a bit at the beginning of the semester, but we all got along. Um, a very interesting story because I have seen each and every one of them grow in their capacity as consultants, as team leaders, as friends. And they have made my job very easy as a team lead. Um, I'm going to highlight Isaac's love for graphs. So <laughs> our very first meeting, Isaac, who is a latest major, made a bar chart that was a compilation of rectangles. 
And I found out because I was trying to change the color of one of the bars from blue to green, and the rectangle was moving. But bad child shouldn't be moving like that. But right now, you'll see that he has grown at, like everyone on the team, and um, so proud of how we've worked with all our four individual clients um, to bring this interesting feedback to you, uh, to you and research-backed uh, insights. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'll just welcome the team right now to carry it away. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Peace. Humanities majors for the win. Um, so we are OFA. As Peace said, we're a little bit special, a little bit different. As opposed to team-based consulting, we offer one-on-one -on -one consulting for our clients. Um, my name is Isaac Trachtenberg. I've had the pleasure of working with Tammy this semester on the Be Glad journaling app. And my name is Suraj Patel. I've had the pleasure of working with Metafund and Dr. Evan Fry on the Pay for Success Dentistry Project. My name is Irene. I've had the pleasure of working with the Amazing Waste Company and Donna Jackson. Hi, I'm Stuart Yamashita. I've been working with Western Industries Corporation on ProPAC. So the Be Glad journaling app is an app in the early stages of development that is intended to help end users improve their mental health through positive journaling prompts. Throughout this project, I've worked to establish a target market, a value proposition and marketing strategy for that target market, and ultimately propose a financial model. The biggest takeaway from this project is that the app should focus on teams and utilize a customizable prompt template. So by using a customizable prompt template to appeal to teams, the app sets itself apart from other apps that are currently on the market. Additionally, uh, from a business perspective, it can capture more end users at once by going to teams as opposed to going to individuals. It also focuses on collective mental health as opposed to other journaling apps that are currently on the market which focus on the individual as opposed to the group. Furthermore, um, the app will be paid for by the organization as opposed to the individual. Now, this team-based approach has been uh, confirmed in interest by two different settings, one from an HR representative at a media company as well as a former president of a sorority here at OU. Uh, confirming that this team-based approach is something that is desired. However, the, team, the app should launch on college campuses as opposed to in the business setting for a couple of reasons. First of all, I have confirmed interest across 150 students. 75% of them expressed interest in a journaling app for mental health. Additionally, marketing costs will be less expensive starting on college campuses. Furthermore, the app will be able to appeal to more groups by la launching on a college campus as opposed to focusing on one business. Going to one campus, you're going to have many, many organizations at once. For example, here at OU, we have Greek Life, Housing, and Camp Crimson as potential organizations that could purchase the app. So there are a potential over 1,500 potential users here at OU, however, the app will only need to sign 350 users in the first year to break even. There's an $8,000 upfront cost for development. We signed 350 users in the first year. We can break even, then spend more money on marketing costs and expand to other campuses. With a cost of $40 per user, this app fits somewhere in between other journaling apps that are currently available as well as other app, mental health apps that are available for teams such as Headspace or Calm. Now, the next steps of this project will revolve around getting the app developed, then eventually spreading to college campuses and ultimately looking to expand into the corporate setting. Thank you, and I would like to pass it off to Siraj. Thank you, Isaac. Metafund is a community development financial institution venture capital firm, and in conjunction with Dr. Evan Fry, we are seeking to create a pay-for-success dentistry project. The PFS funding project is a new initiative to help secure upfront funding for social impact projects. The premise of this project is being able to provide preventative oral health care to Oklahomans, as well as decreasing the total number of ER visits related for oral health concerns. Throughout my project and throughout the phases, the key insights to date revolve around being able to identify a value proposition that shows the potential cost savings from visiting an ER room as well as visiting a dentist. Furthermore, being able to determine which intervention would be best suited for this PFS structure. 
Currently, the issue revolves around the lack of oral health awareness and education within Oklahoma. Furthermore, adding the lack of dental clinics being able to serve those in need, which has led to deteriorating economic and oral health of Oklahomans. These factors have le led to approximately 24,000 yearly ER visits, which has led costing the state of Oklahoma an estimated $50 million a year. Taking a closer look into the value proposition, we're able to compare the visit of a dental procedure such as a simple extraction when visiting the ER, which would cost the state an estimated $1,900. However, compared to visiting a dentist, it would cost the state an estimated $200. This has an estimated savings of $1,700 per patient for a simple extraction procedure. The patient is also able to receive the proper care that they need as well as the proper education. When researching the potential interventions which would be best suited for this paper success project, the nonprofit partnership and the ER room diversion stood out. The nonprofit partnership would revolve around partnering with nonprofits who already focus on oral health care within Oklahoma. The ER room diversion would revolve around setting up a structurally referral program which would help patients have a more prioritized appointment such as the next day, meaning they would be able to get the care that they need from a dental provider within the network clinics. Throughout my research, the intervention that I would recommend that would be most viable for this PFS structure would be the ER room diversion because of its previous proven success in other states. Now, how does the PFS structure work? We've identified the issue and we're able to provide the evidence. We have our areas of need. Once we select an intervention, we're able to provide this preventative oral health care as well as education that is needed to these Oklahomans. This would lead to better dental health as well as less ER visits in the state, which would meet the success criteria set forth within the paper success contracts with the state, which would lead to our back-end payment, help our upfront investment, which could potentially be provided by Medifund, a social impact investment venture capital firm. The next steps of my project would revolve around determining which intervention would be most feasible for this paper success structure, assembling a contract with the state of Oklahoma, as well as determining what those success criteria would be in order to receive the back-end payments. With that, I would like to pass it off to Irene. The Amazing Waste Company aims to understand how we can provide value to the waste disposal systems of healthcare facilities. The company has a device which is known as a Piranha, and this device reduces the volume of waste to about 25 to 60 percent of its original volume. Of the total amount of waste generated by healthcare facilities, 85 percent of those are non-hazardous general waste. These are the waste that the Piranha device will be targeting. Interview done with the Dell Sutton Medical uh, Center showed that these hospitals are interested in the value that the Piranha has to provide in terms of efficiency as well as the cost reduction to the hospitals. My uh, objectives throughout the semester has been to identify a target market as well as find the value that the Piranha could have to the healthcare facilities, propose a business model and build up a financial model for the Amazing Waste Company. On the onset of the project, of the first side of the project, which is identifying a target market, the research has shown that general hospitals represent a $3.7 million market size in the state of Oklahoma as well as Texas. Now, this is twice as much the market size for children's hospital and nursing homes. Some key features that showed up for these ideal markets include hospitals that utilize a compactor as well as having a holding room. Another key insight from these um, targeted um, hospitals show that they use on average about five dumpsters. This could go up to about nine dumpsters for hospitals that generate a lot more waste. Now, these said hospitals also showed interest in wanting to reduce the total cost that they spend yearly in the dumpster um, expenses. With the Piranha, they could reduce their costs up to about $18,000 a year. Now, how would, the, uh, how would Amazing Waste Company make these Piranha devices reach out to general hospitals? The company can incorporate third-party logistics companies into the business model for ease of customer reachability. The third-party logistics companies would act as a liaison between the Amazing Waste Company for transferring of the Piranha to the general hospitals. Now, the benefits of using a third-party companies include that the, these companies would handle the logistics, um, the distribution and order fulfillments associated with this process, whereas Amazing Waste will focus solely on manufacturing and production of the Piranha device. With this, the cost flow to the Amazing Waste Company would primarily be in terms of manufacturing production and the contracts with the third-party companies, 
whereas the revenue flow would be in terms of uh, the leasing of the piranha at a yearly basis. Now, taking into consideration these costs from manufacturing and contracting, as well as the revenue flow from leasing a piranha, Amazing Waste will break even in the third year and will have a total five-year profit of about $522,000. Now, key assumptions to make here are that the piranha would be leased at a $750 per month basis and that there is an incremental successive growth rate for the startup company of 1% each year. With these insights throughout the semester, the next step for the Amazing Waste Company would be to apply for grants from states and private um, institutions in order to finish up the pending, pending patents for the, for the Piranha device, as well as grow into the general hospital markets. Thank you. With this, I will now pass it on to my colleague. Thank you, Irene. Western Industries Corporation is a custom packaging company aimed at delivering efficient and effective pack solutions to their clients. They entered the ERP market looking for a solution that would fit their business. They didn't find one, so they developed their own in-house ERP software called ProPack. ProPack has a unique raw optimization module that allows WIC to limit waste in the manufacturing process. They want to know if this software is profitable. So far in the duration of the project, I've gained an understanding of the market, outlined a pricing strategy, and researched successful spin-off needs. Most important insight to date is that ProPack should market the software as an ERP add-on specifically using the raw optimization module. The market for this software would be $10.2 million. This comes from the total ERP market of $10 billion in the United States. But due to the nature of ERP add-ons, add they must partner with ERP vendors, and the ones we selected represent 31% of the market. The raw optimization module must also work with cutting manufacturers, which represents 3% of the market. And with a capture rate of 10%, this leaves a $10.2 million market. This capture rate may fluctuate, though, depending on the uniqueness of the raw optimization software, as recently there has been identified similar software already on the market. ProPack Pro should be priced at $250 per user per year, as this would allow 75% of the market to afford the software. Right now, 75% of the market spends more than $2,400 per year per user on software. The majority of this funding does go towards the ERP software and its support, but this would allow 10% of the funding to go towards ProPack. The business model allows for two revenue streams, the first being the implementation fee, which occurs at the purchase of the software, it only occurs a single time, and the licensing fee would recur every single year for each user. The three major costs for ProPack would be the IT, implementation, the IT support personnel, the implementation personnel, and the marketing costs. Those costs would go towards sales representatives and trade shows. It's important to note that ProPack should be a cloud-based software, as this allows the software to be easily distributed to the clients and updates to be sent out without having to go to client sites. Ideally, ProPack will break even in the fourth year, becoming profitable in the third year, with the major cost in the first year being the development cost of the app. Although that development cost can vary quite a bit, it still leaves a lot of room to break even in the fourth year. To successfully enter the market, ProPack should first program the raw optimization module to run as a third-party software, and then consider launching a pilot program to outline the specific needs to successfully implement the software in a client. Lastly, they should contact the Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance to leverage that relationship for future clients. Thank you for your time and attention. I would like, now like to open the floor for questions. These, these would target the, the small, mid-size, and smaller on the larger size manufacturers that would be best suited for ProPack. And it also captures the majority of that market without using the many, many small ERP providers that are also out there. That's a great question. So the question was about advertising to housing specifically. 
um, and covering the cost, essentially. Is that correct? Am I understanding that? Um, yeah, so the ideally, the cost would not be funded by the students. That would come from the administration. And this is something that would provide value overall for the mental health of the team. So um, I, my research didn't take me to the exact ins and outs of the budget specifically for housing necessarily. However, with 150 RAs roughly, that would be a reasonable cost that the university would be able to afford just based on how much value it would provide for, for their students. So the question was, what might be the largest implementation challenges? From my research, the largest implementation challenges would be uh, having a cooperative discussion with state officials, uh, whether that be legislators or uh, state officials within Medicaid or any other health services, such as the Oklahoma Health Care Authority. Uh, just having a cooperative discussion with them, as well as dental professionals and uh, hospital ER rooms. I know they're very um, picky with their data uh, not being shared, so the total cost, but we were able to identify some cost savings, but I would say that's the largest uh, implementation issue is uh, getting everyone on the same page. So the question is why um, the, in the model it's a leasing and instead of selling out the device. So it's um, the s leasing out the device for about $750 a month would be able to provide the Amazing Waste Company with a yearly profit of 9,000. And with successive years, this would also provide additional um, profits to the company as opposed to a one-time sale. So there is like recurring um, customers as well as retaining the old customers that um, the company would have had. Time for one more question. The question was if this app could be used at other universities outside of OU. Um, definitely something that would provide value in different settings outside of OU. My research was focused specifically here because that was what was available to me. However, uh, this model could be replicated at other similarly sized universities where there would be the same kinds of organizations on that campus. Uh, so hello everyone, we are the Software Business Accelerator or SOBA team leads this semester. My name is Arjun Ganesan, I'm the developer team lead. I'm Hayden Hoffman, I'm the consulting team lead. Um, and through this semester, I've had the privilege of working with these five developer interns. Um, and through all the work we've done this semester, there are definitely a few moments I don't think I'll be forgetting anytime soon. Uh, like Addie, who refused to use the Control S shortcut on her keyboard to save documents and insisted on manually clicking file and save every time. Or Edward, who on numerous occasions promised to bring his nice camera to take a group picture of all of us, but then constantly forgetting to actually bring it. Uh, I'm literally just insulting you guys right now. <laughs> but no, uh, this is, uh, I don't think I could have asked for a better team of developers to work with. Uh, this is one of the most uh, talented, dedicated, hardworking, passionate groups of people I've ever worked with, and I'm incredibly proud of the work they've done this semester. the business team. One thing about this team is I really never knew what to expect going into every meeting, uh, just as far as the personalities involved or stories that were going to be told. And so working with this team, I've not only developed the team that I've worked with, but four friendships that I value way past ICCDW. And so just going one by one, starting off with Samaya. Uh, she was always kind of quiet, but she was almost also willing to wear a lot of hats on our team and, uh, and you know, speak up when needed, especially when we talk about Taylor Swift. Uh, that was one thing she liked to talk about. 
I tried to get Taylor to come today. I don't see her. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> uh, talk about Richie. She's kind of a superhuman. She took 21 hours this semester, as well as three different jobs while applying to grad school. And so I think she's going to write a book on multitasking and time management soon. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, Sarah, Sarah is one of the most driven and hardworking people I've ever worked with and never really backing down from any new experiences. Speaking of a new experience with Sarah, she tried to give blood not too long ago and she passed out before she even got to draw any. So, uh, And then finally, Zareen, uh, I mentioned that this is a very uh, loud and, I don't know, really personable team and she's kind of the epitome of this team and that's kind of why we threw her at all the interviews that nobody else really wanted to do. And uh, she was also, she was always willing to get the answer and ask and ask and ask until she finally got it. And so uh, she was also willing to talk to all sorts of new people and uh, really valued her input. And so uh, a couple thank yous. Our fellow Drew Yamashita uh, just got back from the Officer Candidate School at the United States Marine Corps, which is awesome. Um, and then our clients, Dr. Moores, Dr. Capretto, Dr. Lees, and Dr. Wu for all their continuous support and communication with us. Uh, without further ado, we'd like to introduce the SOAP interns to uh, let them show you what work they've done this semester. All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. We are this semester's Software Business Accelerator team, and we are proud to have partnered with our clients in OU Health and Science Center to bring to you ASDA the first interactive and gamified sexual health education app for preteens with autism spectrum disorder. I am Zarina Nan Khan. I'm a senior pursuing an accelerated master's in management information technology with a minor in economics. My name is Sarah Eltel. I am a senior studying entrepreneurship with a minor in finance. My name is Richie Wei. I'm a senior with a double major in international study and philosophy. And my name is Sumei Sandhu. I am a senior majoring in finance and management information systems. My name is Marcos. I'm a junior studying computer science. My name is Addy Kammerlocker, and I'm a junior also studying computer science. My name is Benjamin Shah, and I'm a senior studying computer science. My name is Edward Rialli, and I'm a senior studying management information systems. And I am Rabi Abu Taha, a junior studying electrical engineering with a minor in computer science. So for preteens with autism spectrum disorder, there is a lack of interactive and gamified sexual health education resources. From an interview with the healthcare provider, we were told that children with ASD are often victimized, accused of inappropriate behavior, and suffer from a lower quality of life due to lack of knowledge on sexual or gender references and anatomy and signs of illness. ASDA will help improve the quality of life of two major populations, preteens with ASD and their parents. From more than 10 doctor and parent interviews, we were indicated about this lack of engaging resource to learn sexual health, where 44% of children with ASD suffer from peer victimization. Experts have also recommended to us the need for a trauma-sensitive environment to learn such a sensitive topic. For parents, 60% of parent interviews have indicated that they need to navigate through difficult conversations with their children regarding a topic as sensitive as sexual health education. This is exacerbated by the fact that the curriculum for sexual health education in schools today is geared towards traditionally developed children. And many parents have said that this curriculum is rather heteronormative and ableist. Finally, 56% of children with ASD have both parents working. And this calls for the need for an external resource to help them provide timely and elaborate sexual health education to their children. This resource is ASDA, the fun, interactive, and comprehensive sexual health app for preteens with autism spectrum disorder. Among the many features that this app will contain, it will contain a built-in chat function and an avatar called ASDA that will guide the child through the sexual health material as it helps navigate the child through diff difficult conversations about sexual health. Parents will also be able to change different accessibility settings in the app to tailor the app to their individual child's learning needs. 
Also, to account for the risks preteens with ASD face, we will include built-in warning and reporting features. The market of ASD includes 180,000 families where the children are identified as users and their family parents are defined as a customer. And because ASD is suitable for other preteens who has basic intellectual capacity to learn. Therefore, the market base include 250,000 users. Based on research developed by researchers from Georgetown, sexual health education should start from pre adolescent which is age 10 to 14, because children's sexuality and gender identity start to develop during this stage. And based on another research, 97% of the preteen with SD learn better with technology. And on the customer side, our target customer are 180,000 active parents who are actively involved on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And based on our survey, the parents are willing to pay four to six dollars amounts on the app. And based on and the total addressable market for the app is 10.7 million dollars at the annual growth rate of 8% a year. ASDA is a one-of-a-kind resource as it is the only app, as it will be the only app on the market specifically tailored to adolescents with autism spectrum disorder. Um, ASDA will incorporate unique features such as gamification and interactive elements that will further set it apart from other ASD resources on the market. Um, and uh, through interviews with child psychologists have proven to be effective engaging the attention of a child with ASD. Um, an example is Avatar ASDA, who will guide the child through the app and encourage interactive learning through role play. Interviews with parents have also indicated that they desired a way to be more involved in the child's learning process. The app will incorporate unique features such as progress tracking, content authorization, and a chat function to incorporate greater parental involvement in the app. ASDA will also be affordable and accessible with a subscription price that is 50% cheaper than many other resources on the market and will provide um, and a su subscription model that will provide adequate funding for consistent development of new games and features um, in order to uh, uphold the interactive and engaging aspects of the app. So with the desired features in consideration, the development team has created a working prototype of ASDA and we've recorded some short form videos to help demonstrate the unique user experiences from the child's and the parent's perspective. So the first perspective on the, on the board behind me is that of the parents. Uh, we click the parent portal button, one of two big buttons, uh, and we lead into a parental setting suite that's password protected so that the parent can only access it. From the setting suite, you can access um, settings such as chat logs, achievement logs, and the parent can also uh, enable and disable certain topic modules. Now we'll move on to the child's perspective using ASDA. When they click the play button, they'll be taken to this screen, which is the Topic Town level map screen. ASDA uses a Topic Town structure because it was recommended to us by a child psychologist as being more engaging and interactive than one more traditional list structure. Also, it resembles game structure, and this is one of the key aspects of ASDA. We learned, too, in an interview with a special educator that role play helps keep children with ASD's attention. And in this model, they'll role play explore, exploring different towns associated with different sexual health topics. So after the child clicks into one of the topic towns, they're greeted with a list of submodules for that specific topic. Splitting the content this way is going to make it much more concise for the child, and it's going to make it easier for them to engage with the content. And after the child clicks into one of the submodules, they're greeted with the gamified content. Here we have an example of some gamified content that we've created based off of some sample content from our clients. And as you can see, as the child clicks through the different uh, locations, there is a small character that sort of guides them uh, through the different locations and makes it easier for them to determine uh, whether the place is public, public or private. 
Reinforcing this concept of gamification is the drag and drop game that we've also developed. This drag and drop game helps to have the child be interactive and engaged in the content that they're learning. In this case, the public versus private activities. They're able to drag and drop in between the two separate categories and have a fun time both engaging with the content and making sure that they're retaining the material as they lead in, into the quiz. And such games will be routed to a quiz. We will, ha we will have multiple questions for each quiz per learning module where we will check for the understanding of the kids. And then as the kids go, go through all the questions, they can check for how many questions they have left through a progress bar that appears on the top of the page. And depending on their answers, they will be rewarded by unlocking new learning modules or new add-ons to the character that they selected at the beginning. However, if they answer the questions incorrectly, they will have to repeat the learning module. ASDA will partner with ASD experts to deliver this education resource to preteens with ASD. ASDA as a business will contain content development, app development, marketing, and distribution functions, which will be reinforced by the 15 funding, marketing, and distribution partners that we have identified. Together, ASDA and their partners will deliver this mobile application to the target consumer, who are the parents of preteens with ASD who will in turn pay as to a subscription price of $5 per month or $50 per year. ESTA is going to reach its 180,000 customer on social media platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And the marketing channel I are prioritized based on the amount of audience it's able to reach through each marketing channel. And the first marketing priority is going to be Facebook. So the target customer on Facebook are just member of autism related Facebook group on Facebook. So what we're gonna do is to create a Facebook page and then send out video infographic on the autism related Facebook group. An example can include autism parent support group. And our second marketing priority of ASDA is on Instagram. And the mar marketing target are gonna be the follower of autism related Instagram accounts. So as what ASDA is going to do is to create a Instagram business account and then send out Instagram story and Instagram video fee and in order to spread the influence of ASDA. And the example can include NGO, official Instagram accounts such as Autism Speaks or Life in Autism World. And the third marketing priority is going to be YouTube. So our target mar customer on YouTube are gonna be the subscriber to autism related content creator. And what we're gonna do is to send cu customer testimonial in the YouTube video, introduce to the audience about the feature of ASDA. And because we, we have the privilege to interview lo local NGO, the, and they have agreed to offer marketing for ASDA for free on their social media platform, which is really good. And, but who's going to provide the logistic support for the marketing program? So, ASDA is going to recruit a market development intern, and the market development intern is responsible for first content creation, create the marketing content based on the, the different marketing, marketing needs on different social media platforms, and second, to manage social media ac accounts based on different platforms, and third, discover potential business marketing strategies uh, partnership and then develop strategy partnership with them. After developing our business model and uh, after developing our business model and we have created the following financial hypothesis. ASDA will break even by year three and will generate approximately $2.5 million in profit by year five. This financial hypothesis has been created using the following assumptions. A subscription-based pricing model of $5 per month or $50 per year with a projected near even split between the two purchasing options. Next is the expectation to reach approximately 4,200 users in year one through Oklahoma-based nonprofits and social media, with nearly 100% of them purchasing the app. Next is an expected state-by-state -state expansion partnering with ASD organizations in states with high rates of autism spectrum disorder, including Florida, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Maryland. Um, reaching a larger consumer base of highly involved parents and creating a growth for ASDA. So in order to make all of this happen, we have created a timeline that ASDA, a company that will be two-thirds owned by the University of Oklahoma, to follow along the next 12 months in order to fully utilize and take advantage of the resources here at OU. 
The first step is content creation. And in partnership with the Office of Technology Commercialization, any sexual health content that's created in order to be put into this app will be protected by this office. The second step is applying for grants using the different grant partners that we've established in our business model that will help fund all of the activities needed to bring ASDA to life. And the third step is development. We have found some developing partners that, will, that ASDA can partner with in order to take this project further, such as the School of Computer Science and the K20 Center at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, with a projected timeline that starts in February, these partners will will have the development team start working on the animations needed for the gamified aspect of the app, which will then, then be distributed to different children and different partners in order for beta testing. And then they will take the feedback that's, that's collected after this, this beta testing in order to develop some further developments, such as new add-ons and the new stuff that will be needed later. And working simultaneously with the development, we recommend that ASDA partner with OU startup programs in order to further activities in sales, partnership relations, marketing, and distribution to hopefully bring ASDA to the market by November 2022. We would like to thank our clients, Dr. Lees, Dr. Moore, Dr. Capretto, and Dr. Wu for allowing us to work on such an impactful and innovative project. And we'd like to thank you all for attending our presentation today, and we will be gladly to answer any questions that you have. That's an awesome question. So a lot of it does depend on further development. In our prototype right now, the main feature we were thinking was text-to-speech, and you could enable that, and that would help some children. But uh, really going forward, they're going to try and, you know, obviously capture as many children as they can in the market, but it will be geared more towards, um, like, the higher, higher side. And to add to what Addy mentioned, we have benchmarked against apps across the industry, and something that we have identified works is having customizable settings that allow them to change like sound features, color palettes, and um, features that will kind of make it more um, comfortable for them to use and kind of play games through the app. So that is something that we are also recommending for future development. Yeah, so your question is uh, whether ASDA looked into uh, partnering with schools and connecting to them as a customer. Yeah, so after interviews with uh, some large uh, players in the special education market, such as Vizzle, we came to understand that schools have a very unique way of taking on specific uh, educational resources, and there is no one format that would fit each school. So that would require a longer uh, time for ASDA to reach every school district independently. And reaching parents directly, parents of children with ASD are typically highly involved on Facebook, on different social media platforms, and are always open to trying new resources. So we found that marketing to them would be the most profitable and more uh, feasible way for ASDA to reach the most impact. So we're going to reach our parents through the About Mission media, social media platform because those parents are really engaged on those social media platform. So what we're going to do is to convince them on social media why sexual health education is very important for their children's development. And that's how we're going to make them aware of our products and why our products matter for their kids' sexual health education. So that's our marketing strategy. We 
We've also partnered with various nonprofits across Oklahoma, such as Oklahoma Family Network, Autism Oklahoma, and they have very vast and widespread networks of parents. So they have shown a lot of interest in not only helping us marketing our app by putting it on their website, but introducing it to their parents, spreading it across their partner networks. And so we're hoping together we will be able to build a good like network of consumers. So we did try to reach out to preteens with ASD, be that through uh, parent networks, uh, nonprofits, or Sooner Works at the University of Oklahoma, but we found that the most constructive opinions and feedback have come from the parents who observe their behaviors and their patterns on a daily basis. And we have also interviewed adults with autism to kind of navigate through their experiences at this age and this time and um, how they best absorbed sexual health education and how it contributed to their lives. So taking that interview information, we have integrated the features and the next steps that this app will take. We have time for one more question. Sure, so the question was, what was the biggest technical challenge we faced as a development team? I think for all of us, we all came from kind of different backgrounds. I myself, being an MIS student, didn't have like a core understanding of like computer, computer science algorithms and stuff where these guys had more of an engineering background. So I think really what was interesting was we were learning a brand new language, that being React, from complete scratch, and we really just um, dove headfirst in. I think some of the hardest challenges came in actually developing the content and working with um, our clients because developing this t um, type of content can be really time consuming and we we're fortunate enough to get the public versus private content. But I think when you have a combination of both gathering content for the app and also kind of like starting from almost nothing with a fresh team of individuals, that's where really the challenge came from. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for attending. I, I would just like to pause and once again uh, give a round of applause to these interns. It has been two years since we at ICCW and I think most people um, have participated in live presentations and they did an incredible job. So let's give it up to them. Um, all of our interns, uh, including our two teams with demos, the software team and the product design team, will be in the lobby following these presentations if you'd like to see their designs in person or ask any of them any more questions. Um, I encourage you to stick around.